Welcome everybody. My name is Julie Noblet. I'm the Energy and Climate Program Director at Actera. And if Actera is new to you, I'll just say we are an environmental nonprofit based in Palo Alto. We've been around since 1970. And our mission is to bring people together to create solutions uh, for a healthy planet. Uh, we have a laser focus today on climate change. We want to make it faster, easier, cheaper for people to take action on climate at home, at work, and in between. Um, our programs include Green at Home, which uh, helps everyone reduce energy waste at home and electrify. A Go EV program, which helps people um, get out of their gas-powered cars and into electric vehicles. And then a uh, environmental justice program called Climate Resilient Communities, uh, where we help get uh, free solar panels on low-income houses, for example, many other things. And finally, a Business Environmental Awards, uh, which is very exciting. This is a, one of the Bay Area's uh, oldest Business Environmental Awards programs um, since for 28 years now. And if you know of a... If you know of a great uh, sustainable business, let them know that they have till December 7th to apply. Uh, if you're here, you know that you're at our uh, lecture series, our fall lecture series. We have uh, three lectures in the fall and three in the spring. Our series is underwritten by Mary and Clint Gilliland. We want to thank them very much for that. Other sponsors include the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And of course, we're here thanks to the Foster Art and Wilderness Foundation. How about this museum? Isn't it? I know. It is amazing. And they have generously also sponsored the uh, refreshments. And we're just really grateful to uh, have a home here with, with the Foster. I also want to thank our staff and volunteers who make this happen. Bethany Taylor in the back, Danielle Flanagan next to her, Patty Sexton and Cheryl Woodward who are volunteering up front. So let me uh, talk a little bit about our agenda for the evening. Tonight you're getting a double feature. Uh, we have two for the price of one. Um, and because we have a slightly packed agenda, we're going to ask you to please uh, hold your questions until the end of this, uh, in, until the end. So first we're going to have uh, um, uh, Anne Lee speak, who is a Stanford freshman and a Brower Youth Award winner. So if you're not familiar with Brower Youth Award, um, it recognizes outstanding youth leaders who are making strides in the environmental movement. While she was still in high school back in 2016, she decided that if elected leaders wouldn't take action on climate, she would. And so she co-founded Schools Under 2C, and I'm going to let her talk about that uh, in just a minute. Now, since she's flown in just to be here, <laughs> um, and she, she was going to need to leave right after her remarks, so we're going to pause and uh, take a couple of questions from the audience when she's finished. And after that, we're going to hear from Eugene Cordero. Eugene is a climate scientist and professor in the Department of Meteorology and Climate Science at San Jose State University. And he's also the founder and director of Green Ninja, which is an enterprise that creates educational experiences to help students design a more sustainable world. Green Ninja started as a climate action superhero in the form of both live action and cartoon. Uh, Green Ninja encourages kids to take action to reduce their carbon footprint, and he's produced uh, dozens of really fun short films for kids. Uh, the YouTube channel has nearly 8,000 subscribers. The last time I looked, it's had millions of views, and the videos are, st are getting 1,000 views a day from around the world. Um, his research, which has been funded by NSF and NASA and others, he's really diving into very interesting questions about behavior change as it relates to climate and how young people can influence both their parents' uh, behavior at home and on the road and what kind of carbon reduction impact 
a really high quality environmental education can have. So today, after eight years of really rigorous research and testing, there is a Green Ninja middle school curriculum. And uh, Eugene, I'm expecting, to make, uh, I'm expecting that he'll make an exciting announcement about that tonight. So without any further ado, let me welcome Anne Lee. I'll just um, briefly t um, introduce myself. Before I moved down to California for college, I actually grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So I spent a lot of my childhood outdoors in nature exploring. And as you can see from these photos, one of my favorite activities was actually crabbing and clamming. And my mom and I would always go outdoors every weekend. But as I started to grow older, um, when my mom and I would return to these same spots, these warning signs would start popping up and they would warn you about the danger and the toxins in the water. So ever since I was younger, I became a lot more aware of the environmental impact humans create on nature. And since then, I became a lot more passionate about environmental issues and especially climate change. So fast forward to high school. In my junior year, when I was about 16 or 17, um, it seemed natural for me to take an environmental engineering course at my high school. And this was actually around the time when the Paris Climate Accord was being heavily discussed. And this also coincided with the 2016 presidential election. So in my class, we talked a lot about the Paris Climate Accord, and my classmates and I viewed it as really important to cut carbon emissions and prevent average global temperatures from rising two degrees Celsius in comparison to pre-industrial times. However, I vividly remember the day after the 2016 presidential election. The next day in class, my classmates and I all knew that it was really unlikely that our nation's newly elected leaders would follow through with the Paris Climate Accord, and we were all really devastated. But we decided to use it as an opportunity to take action and make change instead. So we set the goal and decided that even if our nation wouldn't follow through with the Paris Climate Accord, we still could, even though we were still just kids. We set the goal of reducing our school's carbon footprint by a ton each month through a few different sectors, including composting, lighting, and transportation. So to begin, we set up a composting system at our school, and every day after school, you could find me wheeling out these giant yellow compost bins. And my friends would always joke that I was our school's third custodian. <laughs> and then after that, we also went around with lighting pledges, and we encouraged teachers to turn off their lights simply when they left the room, and we just really wanted to make teachers and adults at our school more aware of the impact they made on the environment. Lastly, we also worked with our local city government to develop a mobile application called School Pool. So we offered an incentive program that encouraged students to take more sustainable modes of transportation to and from school. So if students biked, took the bus, or carpooled, etc., they would be rewarded with incentives from local businesses at the end of the month. So over the course of the next few months, we were able to reduce our school's carbon footprint by over two tons each month. But we didn't want to just stop there. We didn't want to just be a compliance campaign, but more importantly, we really wanted to educate others. So I just wanted to backtrack and give a brief story about one of um, the kids at my school named Fred. So there is this student at our school named Fred, and every single day in the cafeteria lunch line, he would grab the styrofoam cup just to put an apple in it. And Fred really didn't care about the environment. But after my friends and I came up with this idea of reducing our school's carbon footprint, I actually saw Fred later on in the lunch line, and we ended up talking about the environment and waste. And long story short, Fred's actually one of my closest friends today. And you can he's wearing the um, black sweatshirt, pointing at the compost, telling people to compost. But what was really funny was he actually ended up becoming the compliance director of our organization. And he was the one who led the composting movement at our school. He also reached out to our cafeteria and convinced them to stop ordering styrofoam altogether, which was really cool for me to see how much he changed over the course of just a year or two. 
So um, through Fred's story, I kind of realized that these smaller individual changes can add up. And if you influence one person, it can really lead to a chain reaction. So my friends and I decided that we would launch this organization, Schools Under 2C. And we decided to challenge schools from all over to emulate our footsteps and reduce their own carbon footprint. So to date, over 50 schools from all over the world, all the way from Australia to Alaska to Nepal, have signed on the Schools Under 2C pledge and have pledged to take action in their community. So at the end of the day, through Fred's story and through Schools Under 2C, we really want to prove that these smaller individual changes you make in your daily life can really add up. And they can not only add up, but they might be able to influence others and start a chain reaction or a ripple and really ca cause a much larger impact than yourself. So our mission at Schools Under 2C is to continue educating and inspiring people from all generations all across the world, one degree Celsius at a time. Thank you. Thank you. I have a two-part question. One, how did you recruit the schools from all, all around the world to participate with you? And two, is this still a high school project at your school or you're still involved with it? Yeah, so that's a really good question. At first, I had no idea how widespread our organization would become. Because at first, we started doing outreach at local high schools and just giving presentations in our community. But after that, we decided to use social media to really try to branch out. So we basically just joined every single Facebook group that involved climate action and started um, reaching out to people through there. So that's really how we started growing. And also with the Brower Youth Awards, um, they really have an international network. So after they produced this mini documentary on schools under 2C, which was really cool. And after that came out, a lot of schools from all over started reaching out to us and we were able to work with them after that. So that was really cool. And then, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So right now I'm, um, I'm studying at Stanford, so I graduated obviously, um, and this is mostly oriented towards high schools, but when I left, I passed this down to some of my really close friends in um, our high school, and they're continuing the organization to this day. And I'm still linked to the, our um, Schools Under 2C email, so it's really cool getting an email every few weeks from a new school from somewhere like Alaska or somewhere, and um, seeing them get involved. Thank well, it's so nice to be here this evening um, and to see some old friends that I haven't seen in a while and to make some new friends. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take you on a, a kind of a, a, a journey. And that's a journey of, of me as a scientist moving into an education space. Um, and I look forward to hearing your feedback and your insights. So we'll just, uh, we'll just start. I'm a professor at San Jose State. Um, this is me. Uh, I do have a PhD in the atmospheric sciences. Um, but for some reason, uh, some people call me Dr. Burrito. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to kind of share with you how that actually happened. So it started at, when I was a student at Cal State Northridge, giving a public speaking class. And I showed this set of chemical reactions. And this set of chemical reactions um, basically outlines how chlorine can react with ozone and ultimately reproduce something that'll destroy chlorine again. <clears throat> this is called a catalytic cycle. And one chlorine atom can react with ozone 100,000 times or more in this catalytic cycle. And as a result of this type of chemical reaction, um, it could produce, in very, in very extreme conditions, it can produce the Antarctic ozone hole, which was a big surprise to the NASA scientists when they first detected this. So I ended up working at NASA at the Goddard Space Flight Center, working on a team of scientists studying the ozone layer. And that's how I got interested in the environment. Uh, here's a, a chart that shows the thickness of the ozone layer um, from 1960 through to today. This is from a, a friend of mine, a colleague, Paul Newman, at NASA Goddard, a different Paul Newman that you may know. Um, 
but uh, he's a climate scientist. And here's the projection for the future. And this is really good news, because what we see is that the ozone layer is going to recover. And the reason it's going to recover is because we have phased out ozone-depleting chemicals. It's because we listened to the scientists who said what was going to happen. The policymakers reacted in a way that made sense. And we have phased out those chemicals, replacing them with more ozone-friendly chemicals. But Paul Newman ran another set of simulations. And those simulations asked the question, what if we didn't pay attention to the scientists? What if we said that that was bogus of what they were doing? Or what if we said, oh, it doesn't matter that much? Or we'll do it later? And so he ran a set of simulations which he called the future world that we avoided. And here's what would have happened to the ozone layer if we hadn't done anything. We would have lost more than half of the ozone layer. And we know that the ozone layer is the protective shield that filters out the high energy ultraviolet radiation. There's something called the UV index, which comes out uh, a forecast of it every day. It tells you how strong the sun is at different places. You can see over California, it gets up to 8 or 10 or 12. Well, here's what the UV index would have looked like in the future world that we avoided. We'd have UV indexes up to 20 or, th or 30. That would mean that the average person by the year 2050 could be sunburned in less than five minutes. That would mean that this might be a more regular occurrence, or hopefully this wouldn't be a regular occurrence. <laughs> and that we might have to live more like this in that future world that we avoided. Fortunately, we avoided that. And in fact, NASA released uh, some news just last week that said that the ozone hole is really starting to recover. Now, it's still going to take 30 or 40 more years because those gases have long atmospheric lifetimes, but we are on the path to doing something about ozone depletion. So uh, I worked on ozone um, with some of those scientists um, for about 10 years, and we basically thought, OK, the science is done. Policymakers have acted. We're going to move on to other things. And primarily, what most of those atmospheric scientists are working in is in the field of climate change. So most of you know a lot about climate change because you care about the environment. You've heard about it. Uh, this is the record of temperature over the last 100 and plus years. And you can see that the temperature actually fluctuates a lot. It kind of goes up and down. But obviously, you don't have to be a statistician to see that, especially over the last 30 years, that the, the trend in the temperature has been going up. And that's the warming of our planet. Um, we see lots of evidence of that in other ways. Here's some ice that was um, a, a giant glacier in 1918. And today, we can see how much that's been diminished. Uh, here's another one in 1922 in uh, Alaska. And today, almost all of that glacier is gone, which is very remarkable. Actually, even more remarkable is that this little, gla this little iceberg right here is still there after 80 <laughs> years of warming. <laughs> yes, that's a joke. Um, but the decline in Arctic sea ice isn't. And this image here, which the yellow line shows you what the Arctic sea ice used to look like and compared to today, um, is part of a trend of declining amounts of ice over the Arctic. All of these are signals of our warmer planet. Um, now, this is not just something that's happening out in the future. This is happening right now. And in 2016, we had 15 weather and climate disasters that cost over a billion dollars. And last year, we haven't even calculated all of them. Um, because the fires in California were still getting estimates, but over $300 billion in damage um, as a result of weather and climate. Um, we have fires and flooding in the West. We have these hurricanes. I mean, the situation in Puerto Rico is still ongoing. Um, so this is really happening right now. What are the predictions for the future? Now, this is actually an open question that's, that's pretty interesting. And it's challenging to answer because there's a lot of things we don't know about the future, like how many people are going to be around, like what kind of cars they're going to drive, like what kind of energy we're going to use, like those. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we calculate these scenarios, and we have these different possible futures. And each of these scenarios um, represent a different possible future. The red one, which goes up the most quickly, is, is somewhat similar to a business as usual scenario. Whereas this one, you know, we start to stabilize the climate. Now, <clears throat> climate negotiations are challenging, the Paris Accord being one of them. 
and we have a hard time agreeing on things. But one thing we have agreed on is that two degrees Celsius should maybe be the, the top limit for the warming that we allow. Some people would argue even lower, 1.5. But let's just say two degrees. The United Nations has agreed to the countries that two degrees would be a good target. So you can see that in these scenarios, we don't even reach two degrees. But there is a scenario where we could stay below that critical threshold. And the question that I have for all of us and that we're mostly thinking about is how do we get on that trajectory? What do we have to do to produce this? So this is a, it'll tell you something about how much carbon you can put in the atmosphere and ultimately can tell you about how we need to live our lifestyle. So how do we get there? Well, we have to do things like this. The things that we're familiar with, um, wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, battery technology, lots of other kind of technologies, maybe some geoengineering, maybe nuclear power. There could be a whole bunch of different possibilities. And what's exciting about living here in Silicon Valley and in California is that we hear about this stuff all the time. And we have some visionary folks who are working in this space, and it's exciting. But from my perspective, we're missing a key piece to that. And in 1992, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change identified this piece. And they said, education is an essential element for mounting an adequate global response to climate change. And what they're talking about is about human capital. They're talking about, you know, like, it's not the technology isolated, but that you need inspiration, you need knowledge, you need leadership to take that transition from some technology to actually make it happen. And sadly, at least from my perspective, we're not doing that. That you see a lot of money invested in, in technology, but you don't see a lot of money invested in education. In fact, I would argue almost see none. So I uh, ended up at San Jose State University. I've been there 16 years. And um, I had an interlude in Australia where I was at, the, um, at Monash University studying ozone. And then when I came to, um, to San Jose State, I became a climate scientist as the, as the atmospheric science community was moving to studying the climate system. But I also became very interested in education. And I had um, started doing some research in the education field. I had published some papers. And so it was time to try to put together the atmospheric part and the education part. In, in, some, in some way. But uh, like life happens, things happen that you don't expect. And uh, I ended up co-authoring a book with Laura Steck, who's right here. <laughs> and this is a book called Cool Cuisine. And it changed my trajectory in some kind of interesting ways. Laura worked at Actera for 11 years. <laughs> so, um, and Laura asked me, hey, do you wanna write this, do you wanna write a book with me? Um, I'm the only climate scientist she happened to know at the time. Um, and she wanted to write a book about food and climate change. And, and we did that. And it made me, as in, in addition to various other things, it made me think about my own personal connection to this issue of climate change. And what's my own carbon footprint? And so I started thinking about the things that I like in life. And there's two of them in particular. Um, and folks who know me know this to be true. Um, bicycles and burritos. In fact, I really do like burritos quite a bit. I created something called the Burrito Enjoyment Index. <laughs> and uh, I looked at the average American compared to myself <laughs> and was able to verify using strict scientific uh, methodologies that indeed I was quite interested in burritos, much more so than the average American. But I started to, uh, to study burritos in particular, and I did a, something called a burrito showdown where I calculate the carbon footprint of a chicken burrito versus a beef burrito. And I was really surprised to see, and Laura and I kind of illustrated this over 10 years ago in our book, about the difference in terms of your diet. And of course, I'm kind of playing with this issue of burritos, but I'm also, like I said, interested in transportation and biking. So we compared uh, driving with eating. And what we found is that your choice of vehicle, whether you drive a big vehicle or a Toyota Prius, produces the same carbon emissions as your choice of diet or the type of burrito that you eat. Now, what about, uh, what about bicycles? What's the carbon footprint of riding a bike? 
Zero. Is that true? No. 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 Because you need your fuel. Where do you get your fuel from? Burritos. burritos thank you. <laughs> so exactly. So depending on the flavor of burrito that you eat, <laughs> the fuel economy of riding a bicycle is between 75 and 500 miles per gallon equivalent. So these were, uh, these were some things we learned. And uh, Laura and I gave over 100 talks on the issues of climate change. We talked about food. Um, we talked about burritos. And, and Laura talked and actually would demonstrate how to cook a diet that has a low carbon footprint and has a high vibe, tastes great. And, and you're happy to be welcome, encourage you to talk to her after. She has, she's still working in that area. Um, and after giving these kind of talks, <clears throat> very similar to this kind of group of folks who are interested, um, I realized that there was one group of the audience that was not getting this message. <laughs> and those were young people. And uh, I will credit Julie Novlet for actually producing this chart. <laughs> so, um, so we decided to tell these very similar type of stories, but to a younger audience. And uh, so I started working with folks at San Jose State University in the arts field, um, in animation, uh, and also in education. And so we work together to tell stories about climate change and what they can do about chi climate change. And that's how Green Ninja got started. So over 10 years ago, we started by creating a series of films and we've made some games and developed events which were focused on solutions to climate change. And, um, and we started with just a simple film, and the idea was public education, ultimately. And this really became a platform for studying education and its impact. And I'm going to show you a couple case studies uh, for this work and share with you what we learned. So the first case study is about middle school students, and the second one is in college students. And we're just trying things. So we get a little bit of funding from someone, and then we just like put it in schools and see what happens. So the first one was something called a DIY, do-it-yourself home energy kit. And we gave students, um, we had four local middle schools, over 500 students, and we gave them a kit that they could take home. And it would allow them to interrogate energy use in their home, look at their fridge, thermo fridge temperature, do various things. We made some videos that went with it. And then we had them monitoring their energy using smart meter data. And so here's a, the classroom average a class of 30 students, the energy they used in their baseline period, and then the energy they used during a conservation period where we asked them to bug their parents and their brothers and sisters and to do something at home to reduce energy use. And what we found is that with this fairly simple activity set that students were required to do because it was part of their learning in science class, uh, we were able to reduce their energy use in home from their electricity and natural gas by about 20% during the conservation period. And in some cases, we saw that this persisted over time as well. So this was interesting for us. And, and as a professor, if you were students in my class, I could basically make you do anything because you're in my class. And I cite as a homework problem. And you have to go home and, like, and do something in your home. And so the idea of having students learn science and engineering by experimenting with their own home and kind of interacting with their own family members um, became something that we found to be quite successful. The other uh, case study, which has a little bit longer trajectory, is that uh, as a faculty member at San Jose State, I was trying things all the time. Um, every semester, I want to try something different with my students and see how they react and see how their attitudes and the behaviors might, might respond to different types of situations. So once uh, me and a colleague thought we had kind of like, I wouldn't say perfected, but we had some good ideas, we uh, started it with this one year course. And our goal in this course was to change students' lives forever. We had nine units, uh, six units in the fall, three units in the, in the spring, and um, <clears throat> we had about 100 students per semester. And we taught this class um, it's still actually ongoing, but we took students from 2007 to th through 2012, about 500 students, and we surveyed them five years after they took the course. So they'd all graduated and moved on. 
And so we brought them back and we asked them a whole bunch of questions and we gave them these surveys to see, were we really successful? Because the post-survey results from the course were like, yeah, this, many of them said this class was amazing, I didn't know anything about this stuff. But what happened years later? So um, we found that student attitudes, we were able to affect them um, in some interesting ways. That climate change is personal. 80%, this is in the five years plus survey, 80% reported having personally experienced the effects of climate change. Kind of like we are today, right? When you go outside, that smoke, that, those fires, not that we wouldn't have had fires before, but this number of fires, the increase, um, you know, there's a climate connection to that. The students also felt like climate change is fixable. Two thirds of them thought that individual actions could actually make a difference. They had some agency and that persisted over the years. And also, they were engaged in actions. 90% reported that they regularly take some actions to respond to climate change. So then what we did is we took some of their answers and we surveyed them about what kind of actions are they taking. And we used a carbon footprint calculator to estimate what their carbon emissions are. And we compared it with the average person in California. And here's our results. This is the uh, hundreds plus students who participate in our survey. And um, on average, they reduce their carbon emissions by about between, let's say, it's around three tons of carbon per year above the average Californian. And they were doing things like driving hybrid vehicles, choosing to eat more vegetarian diets, um, had installed energy efficient kind of appliances or measures in their home. And like we said, we compared this to the average Californian because we know the Californians are doing a lot of that stuff as well. So then we took that idea and we applied it and using the same methodology as this project drawdown, which some of you have heard of, which is this comprehensive plan to reverse climate change. And it proposes a whole bunch of different solutions. So just looking at a few of these solutions, um, we compared education. We used the same methodology to look at what role could education, if done in the similar way that we did in our class, what impact could that have if done at scale? So we said, okay, imagine that each student is able to reduce their carbon emissions by 2.9 tons, just like that happened in our class. And let's say that we start off in the year 2020 with 1 million students getting this type of education, and that we scale that by 2050, there's 44 million students. So it's a 12% increase every year. This is the type of scale of solution that you see in Project Drawdown. These are big scale um, types of plans. So what if we made a similar scaled um, action on climate change? And we only took students from high and middle income countries, which have the largest carbon footprint. What would the results look like? Well, if you look at Project Drawdown, you see that rooftop solar, afforestation, offshore wind, those are the ones that produce gigatons solutions of carbon emissions. And we see that education, if done at similar scale, in the same methodology that at least we showed, with a good educational approach, could actually reduce emissions in a similar scale. So that's one of the messages that we found interesting and we're trying to basically advocate for is that education can be as, as impactful as other climate change mitigation strategies. <clears throat> now, we also learned some important things about what made our educational experience unique or interesting. And we found that there were three components that together seemed to produce not only changes in attitude but changes in behavior. That is a personal connection to the issue. Students are invested in, in either seeing climate change happening to themselves or becoming engaged in it. They understand what to do about it. They feel empowered. And the, and the one that is actually I found most interesting is they have an empathy for the environment. And they develop that either at a young age or through some kind of experience. I think the big question is how to scale. How do you get this, how do you do this at scale? We're able to do this with 500 students. How do you do this with a 1 million up to um, 40 million students? Our approach has been to work with young students. Uh, young students are inquisitive, they're curious, 
they're open to new ideas. Um, and this study by Lasnak and Pollan suggests that children uh, uh, report that children average a purchase influencing attempt <laughs> every two minutes when shopping with their parents. And you can really imagine them kind of tugging on their mom or dad, I want that thing. They also interact, they spend a majority of their time in a school environment. And that school environment has national standards. And fortunately, the new national standards, the, the companion to Common Core, is called the Next Generation Science Standards. And for the first time, really ever, now they include direct connections to climate change, to human impact, to engineering design. They're actually really designed for studying problems like climate change. And California's version even have these environmental principles. And the folks at the California Department of Education really care about the environment and they really care about climate change. Fortunately, California was just about to adopt the, the Next Generation Science Standards with a rollout of materials in 2019. Now, um, one of the challenges in teaching science for some communities is that science isn't seen as engaging or interesting. And so we thought we could apply the kind of Green Ninja filter where we are using stories, we're using games, we're using action-oriented characters to make science interesting and engaging. So uh, as Julie mentioned, we've made over 50 films. Uh, we have five, over five million views on our YouTube channel. And we use humor deliberately to discuss environmental subjects. And one of our favorite subjects is burritos. <laughs> no, it's not our favorite subject. It's probably my favorite subject. So here's a, uh, I, and I, this was not my goal in life to become a, a, a star on these quirky <laughs> films, but here I am interrogating two different flavors of burritos with my burrito meter. And, uh, oh, and here's another one. You've never seen this photo before probably in your life. So this is a burrito farm. This is where, this is where the Chipotle burritos come from. You don't know that because they snip off the roots, but look at the roots <laughs> on that burrito. They're really clean, they, they snip them off cleanly before you get your burrito. So yeah, it's just silly, it's just quirky stuff, but uh, there is a deliberate attempt because the issue of the environment and climate change is actually pretty depressing when you can understand the scale of it. And so we deliberately use humor um, as one of the avenues for connecting with young people. That's not the only one though, of course. So we decided that we had studied this stuff enough that we had like, you know, as academics, the critique of academics is they like to write papers and go to conferences and they're not really involved in the real world. So in 2016, we started our own company um, called Green Ninja and our goal was to develop educational curriculum for schools. And so because the next generation science standards were coming, we produced grade six, seven, and eight curriculum, um, which we applied for in April of 2018. And especially my goal was to measure environmental impact. And in fact, the reason that I think that Elon Musk is not tweeting about education and that we don't have more venture capitalists funding education is because we have not demonstrated that education can have uh, environmental benefit. We haven't demonstrated with pounds of CO2 or gigatons. And although we know anecdotally, we know that it's really important. And almost all of us in here today could trace their lineage of interest in the environment to a teacher or to experience or to a camp. You know, we haven't, in the environmental ed community, we have not demonstrated that enough to convince people that we should be investing in that. And so as part of Green Ninja, we wanted to develop educational experiences that allowed us not every single moment, but at times to measure the environmental impact so that we could, we could see if we're successful and that also that we could demonstrate to others the value of, of this flavor, of this type of education. So um, I'm just gonna show you, so we've, we've actually created this middle school science curriculum um, with funding from NASA and NSF and from a company called World Centric which started here in, in Palo Alto. And uh, the focus of our curriculum uses three kind of themes. <clears throat> We use story and storytelling, that humor piece is in there, but more importantly, we want students to tell their own stories about how they are the solution creators and what that means for their own community. We want students to go home and feel like they're experts in their home about energy, about 
soil, about ecosystems. We also want students to learn science, all types of science, through the lens of environmental solutions. So we teach earth science and life science and physical science and engineering design. We teach coding, all of it around solving environmental problems. And we use data and technology. We want students interrogating data. We want them using data because that's how we're going to really learn what's going to be an appropriate solution. So we have three grades of material. There's 180 lessons per grade that's required by the Department of Education. Um, <clears throat> grade six focuses on climate, grade seven on resources, grade eight on living systems. And we believe that if a student was to spend three years doing Green Ninja curriculum, that the outcomes of the student experience would be a vastly improved understanding of the environment and their own personal agency, but also improve their science interest, communication skills, career awareness. We know that we can't produce a curriculum that's just focused on environmental stewardship because the schools won't buy it. Maybe there'll be a few schools who care. Schools care about these other, they care about career awareness, computer tech skills, science interests, confidence, because schools are responsible for education. So our goal in developing Green Ninja curriculum is to develop a curriculum that can compete with other publishers, but that has a co-benefit of environmental stewardship and agency. So if we dive down, I just wanted to show you like one particular grade. Um, here's a, a unit on minerals, and every unit has a challenge. This particular challenge is designing a smarter smartphone. Students are going to learn about plate tectonics, and they're going to learn about minerals. Um, but it's focused around an environmental topic. Uh, <clears throat> unit two is about petroleum. They're going to try to reduce the carbon footprint of transportation for their family. And unit three is about food. Reducing the carbon footprint of food, they're going to create a, a classroom cookbook with low carbon foods. So these are just examples of the units of instruction and how we frame them around uh, some kind of solving some kind of local environmental problem. And here's the other three units, uh, soil, um, about water, and ecosystems for grade seven. If we look at one particular unit, we start with a Green Ninja film. And uh, so here's a film about some silly film. These are only one or two minutes long. It's just kind of an engagement piece. And then the students will follow a kind of path. This is actually for the teacher, where they're gonna look at you know, they're gonna learn different science concepts, but the culminating experience, you know, we're trying to provide them a context for why they're learning science. So you're gonna learn these sciences because you're trying to understand the carbon footprints of food. We also uh, include a lot of hands-on learning and there's kits that come for the teacher to do hands-on science. And that's what the new standards are really focused on, is student-centered, inquiry-based learning. And it really fits in well with learning about the environment, especially locally. Of course, our notion is that young people can become activists, become active in their community, and could become like this group of San Jose State students who are studying engineering, but they're studying this, they're developing something called the Spartan Superhighway, which is uh, a system that's supposed to powered by solar panels, move people from Mountain View to Google and back again, or you know, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but some, some smart energy, low energy type of transportation. So California is a big place. <clears throat> the Department of Education um, is responsible for how science is taught in the state. Uh, there's six million students. They do publisher adoption every eight years. And in fact, um, right now, the districts, the 1,000 school districts in California are gonna be deciding which publisher they're going to, to use for the next eight years. So kind of the educational trajectory for six million students is gonna be decided in the next 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> and uh, there is a very rigorous process for being accepted on the Department of Education's list of approved providers. So we applied in April. We produced the 180 lessons per year. We went through the whole thing and they had us in Sacramento. And as Julie mentioned, uh, we just found out last week that uh, Green Ninja is on the list of one of the approved pu publishers. <laughs> we are very, very excited. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, one of my one of my friends says your name sounds cooler than these other ones, you know. <laughs> but uh, a cool name isn't going to do it alone. But um, we we did this deliberately. We we knew that we had been giving away our curriculum for free for a number of years, lessons or series of lessons. Um, but in in reality, districts are have a, an obligation to, to teach and educate students, and um, they buy materials for that. And when we gave away stuff for free, they really didn't value it. Now when we have a product to sell, um, they'll compare us to Pearson or McGraw-Hill, to other big publishers, and, um, and if we stack up, then, then they may choose us, and if they do, it gets distributed throughout the whole district. So our potential to scale is actually much higher going through this effort. We spent the last three years developing curriculum not giving it away for free, not tabling, not doing all the other things we used to do, um, but, but trying to get on this list so that we can become a provider of education you know, at scale. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, last month, the IPCC released a report about um, the state of our climate, and it was very grim. It was the grimmest report I've ever seen from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Scientists are typically conservative. They don't ring the alarm bells. That's environmental activists, like some of the folks in here. The climate scientists are like, yeah, we expect things to slowly go. But this report was really, really strong. And uh, they really painted a picture, in fact, this comes from their report, of like, what do we want our planet to be like? And the chart they showed um, showed our trajectory. Here's the emissions and how we have to have them peak and go down. And in fact, I've never seen this before in the any of the reporting, that we had to have negative emissions to reach our target, meaning that we've got to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, otherwise, we're not, going to, we're not going to reach the target one and a half or two degrees C. And they gave a number, like 12 years or something like that. We have 12 years to reach our emission peak, and that we have to dramatically reduce it at that point. And some of the folks in here have thought of this quite deeply, and we know what a challenge this is. So all of those solutions that we saw in Project, Project Drawdown, we have to be doing those. But I would suggest that we also have to include education. We can't dismiss the power of, of people's inspiration. And if we could take the inspiration we had in this, in this room here and what we've been doing for the number of years, and if we can scale that, then some of these technologies can come into fruition much more quickly and much more rapidly. So um, I want to offer to, to all of us that we have to work together to get there. And that, you know, and that we have to do this quickly and at scale. Um, I've actually worked with a number of folks in this room who have been very, very helpful to our project. We're a small group of folks who came out of research at San Jose State just a handful of people working in this space. Um, but we're looking for other folks too, and we know that it takes a, a community of people to be successful. In our particular world, we're looking for folks in, with expertise in technology, in uh, entrepreneurship or business, and in investment. Um, and the time for us, we know the next year to 12 to 18 months is our most important time. So if any of you have ideas about how you can help us be successful, or if, you want, if you're interested in being a part of what we're doing, I'd love to chat with you now or at some other point. Anyhow, thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Hello, my name is Leo, and I'm a student from Los Angeles High School. And um, as a member of a younger generation, I realize that um, competition is a very important part about like, like motivating kids to uh, to support the environmental in initiatives. So are you thinking about incorporating any like competitive elements to your curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> we started by creating something called the Green Ninja Film Festival. That was one of the earliest incarnations of a school-based program where students created films about climate activism, their own or someone else's, and they would submit them to an a external panel Sometimes Julie's been on that board, um, of folks who would look at it. And that's an idea of competition that moves outside the classroom. And I agree with you that, um, that having competitions are ways to kind of spur innovation. Um, I've had some of my colleagues critique that and say, why do you always have to have competitions in your classroom? But 
I think that's part of human nature. Not all of us, but many of us feel like, oh, when there's a competition. In fact, the, the, my former student, Leah, who Julie was just mentioning, in my class of 100 students, that class that I showed you the, the results from, there's a competition about the best project. She said when she heard about it, she said, I want to win that project. And, and her group did. Um, and it inspired her to, to such levels that one day I saw her on campus and I said, oh, she looked a little, I wouldn't say unkept, but a little, a little dirty. I said, Leah, what's going on? She goes, I was just inside this compost bin. Because Subway, she was trying to get Subway to compost. They're not separating the trash properly. And, and I had to go in and clean it. And I had to jump inside that thing. And, and she's fairly usually nicely dressed. So, um, so it shows you that, that I agree with you. I think competition can be. And, and we try to employ that in, in some ways. I think there's other ways to, to do that as well. Hi, I'm on the board of the Environmental Volunteers with with whom, uh, with which many of you may be familiar, we do uh, take hands, train our volunteers to take really fun hands-on science, um, environmental science things into classrooms, uh, K-5, and um, and also on field trips. Well, the environmental volunteers, along with various other environmental organizations, participated over the past few years in a cultural relevancy series of workshops sponsored by an uh, organization called Youth Outside. And one of the things that came up in curriculum was a caution about, um, well, what do you do with when the kids are from cultures where um, telling the parents what to do is really not OK? And then the other is, you have to be really careful in your curriculum not to suggest that the kids go home and tell their parents they need to buy a Tesla or a Prius when that is just not in the cards. Um, how did you deal with those challenges in your um, curriculum? Because I'm sure that came up for you all. Um, so that's a, it's a really great, great question. And I'll tell you that we haven't come up with solutions to, to all of those things. Education is extremely complex, as you kind of are illustrating. We, we just did something. We just created lessons as fast as we could. Um, I'm just being very honest with you. Um, but we consider it an iterative approach, just like engineering design. You, you do something, you put it out there, you get feedback from teachers. Um, we recently got some feedback from some Central Valley teachers that some of those videos are slightly elitist because we're promoting some environmental values that maybe their students are having trouble just getting access to food. So we're providing guidance for teachers about how to frame those videos so that students understand that's kind of a, a, a fantasy world. Let's see what we can learn from that, but we don't have to reflect upon that in our own daily lives so much. Um, so we're learning. So a lot of field testing is the, the best way is to, is to put it out in schools, get feedback from teachers, um, and then adjust. And so we're constantly now adjusting our materials to make it work for, student, for, for students and teachers in different environments. Um, the point you raise about um, students going back into their own homes and feeling that they, of course, want to be respectful for their family and, their, and what their family understands um, is another good point that, um, that we try to help with teachers about how do you, and that's a very challenging, like let's say you go home and you realize, oh, we have all these incandescent light bulbs. They're actually costing us a lot of extra money. And someone will give us LED ones, and we'll be able to save money. And is there a way to do that in a way that still um, respects the kind of uh, experience of their family? Um, that's, that's really challenging. But that's, it's, it's, those are the things we're learning. And, and I anticipate we'll continue to learn and hopefully be able to evolve. Yeah. Hi, this was a really wonderful project. Um, I was just wondering, after you implement this curriculum and um, the students are educated about like environmental issues, how are you, if they were to come up with an idea um, to address a project or an issue in their community, how would you support them in that? So not just educating them, but providing them with the resources to go and... You know, we want this educational experience to extend outside the classroom. And um, the only thing that we've done so far is to provide venues for students to, to showcase their work. So we have this Green Ninja Film Festival. It's a venue for students to be able to show their work and, and more widely disseminate it. Um, for filmmakers and storytellers, 
We encourage them to apply to other film festivals. Um, there is a, another conference in the Bay Area called the YES Conference, where students um, who are working on climate related, and this is middle and high school students, can uh, showcase their work. Um, and I think that the more platforms there are for students to do that, and the more ways for them to demonstrate the impact that they're having, the more impactful it's going to be. And I think that's where connecting with groups that are already doing things like that um, is, can be helpful. And so that's part of kind of getting the message out that, oh, there's this in-school curriculum that's focused on water resources or focused on ecosystems or soil. And you know, if we could partner with some groups who are already doing some things, already have a, a method for showcasing um, great work, then we'd love to partner or, or point the teachers in that direction so the students have a venue for doing that. Um, so you know, we, we don't have a lot of those formal things. We have a few of them, at least one or two each year. But we'd like to have more, because like you said, you know, that's very important. Uh, I have, uh, well, one, your idea of education being the biggest item on that list is a real breakthrough to me. I see it. I really see it. But the thing is, <clears throat> your work, how much are we, you influencing in other states? What are they looking into? And then outside of that, with our government, the Department of Education, are they trying to cut this stuff out? <laughs> I'm afraid that somehow all the work you're doing may be not well supported by the federal government. Other states, um, about 20 states have adopted the Next Generation Science Standards. So not all. Texas and Oklahoma, for example, said no. Um, and yet I was talking to a publisher at National Geographic about what do you do when you're, when you're selling your materials in Texas. He says, we just pull out evolution. We just pull out climate change, and everything else is the same. Um, you know, I think our goal would be to teach science in an engaging way. And, and make the environmental piece this kind of supplementary thing that students love, they're curious, they want to do things, they actually really want to improve their local environment. And I would say that most people on both sides of the political aisle would like to have cleaner air or support cleaner air and clean water. So in some of our materials that go to other states, the word climate change, we remove it. We talk about environmental stewardship, we talk about clean air and clean water. Um, and you'll find that, that in many states that that's a that that's a common theme. Um, in terms of the government's role, uh, states do most of the education stuff, so it's really a state level. So California's doing its own um, education. Common Core was, uh, was nationally distributed, and they tied highway funds and stuff to it. But the, the science standards are uh, statewide. It doesn't make it any easier. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and you know, one of my goals is just to kind of get people to think along this line a little bit more, and maybe to inspire other folks to do other work. Um, you know, we're interested in, in being in other states, of course, as well, but we'd like to see we'd like to see other folks there too. When is your next Green Ninja Film Festival, and who can submit films to it? We have it every May or June, and uh, anyone can submit. You just have to know that it's happening. And so, if you let me know. Um, we accept uh, middle school and high school films and um, that have the general theme of environmental stewardship or climate solutions or something like that. Is there a website that has the criteria? Well, we, we will we'll put that out every year, but yeah, usually three minute films or, or less, although even that we're pretty flexible. Um, we're just trying to provide a, an avenue or a venue for, for student filmmakers uh, and storytellers to have a place for um, showcasing their interest. Hi, I'm just curious, you had a whole list of approved programs. Does that mean that the state will choose one, or can different schools choose it from any of the ones on the list? The district is given a certain pot of money from the state that can only be spent on approved publishers. And from that pot of money, they can then choose from one of those eight or ten, those ten publishers. Um, but every district can, can do what they want. They can also, this time, they can also make their own. But making their own is, is quite a labor, a lot of work. And then they have to show the state that it actually matches the laws that the state has identified. So um, as an example, Palo Alto is going through that process right now. <clears throat> and we were invited to go to the publisher thing in Palo Alto. Um, and I was sharing this with, uh, with Debbie, who's, oh, there she is. I was sharing this with Debbie, is that we were told, 
um, oh, you know, um, Palo Alto, we're probably going to, there's a couple flavors of NGSS. We're going to choose the, the, the flavor that you guys aren't doing. Um, and and I, was, I found it quite curious. Like, they're choosing a, a more traditional approach and not the preferred integrated. So I'll just explain what that means. You probably learned chemistry in a one-year chemistry class and physics in a one-year physics class. But most people think that it's probably better to learn about oceans and you have physics and chemistry together. So you solve it more like how scientists and engineers. And so that's the preferred approach. But Palo Alto has decided, oh, we're probably not going to do the preferred approach. So I actually contacted Debbie and was like, and because she has experience in schools and, and this amazing network, I said, oh, that's curious. I wonder if the parents in Palo Alto know that Palo Alto is about to make this decision, which would exclude some of the curriculum that's more environmentally focused. Um, and, and Debbie's contacted some of her colleagues who might be going to a school board meeting tomorrow to express some of their opinions. So the, um, now you're starting to talk about like, who's making these decisions. It's teachers, it's school boards, it's principals. Um, it gets very complicated. And, and there's a 1,000 districts in California. So, um, so the decision-making process varies from district to district. I have a copy of Laura's book. I get Laura's and yours book. Um, and I'm going to go home and look at it a little more carefully than I have recently. Uh, do you have a recipe in there for burritos? <laughs> I don't think we do. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you.